Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Now, take a look at this fat-ass wood pigeon. Oh yes, that is most professional wildlife photography I hear you say. And well, today, that is the name of the game. Because if you recall, in Campus Fetics 13, our attempts to capture the blue tip was foiled by scuffed autofocus. And well, today, we're back and we have upped the game. Because today, we are gonna be going full National Geographic and we're gonna be capturing all kinds of wildlife. Yes, indeed. The videographic achievements worthy of etchment upon the Pantheon is what's coming your way today. But that's not all. As on top of the award winning shots that will be coming your way today, it is the height of summer and the world has come to life. So rest assured that there's going to be quite a few interesting things to find out here today. And rest assured that you're going to learn today. And so without further ado, let's get ready to go. Right then, here's the plan. 11 kilometers from A to B, and we've got to capture as much wildlife, wild fungi, edible plants, and poisonous plants as we possibly can before sundown. So let's go, and first things first, we're gonna hit you with a wild edible. The clover, the red clover. Trifolium pretense. You know them, you've seen them. They are the floral bloom of the free leaf shamrock, or four leaf shamrock if you are most fortuitous. The red clover is an edible plant and a staple food source in many places, as it is a highly nutritious and a rich source of protein. You are san? Yes, indeed. 20% of its entire dry mass is crude protein, which makes the clover one of the highest vegetable sources of protein out here in the wild. And so if you want to stay ripped and stay vascular out here, then this is a good one to know. One decent handful of red clover flower heads is roughly equivalent to one tenth of a small protein bar, which doesn't seem like much, but it's better than a kick in the bollocks, or is it? For you see, this plant also contains isoflavines or phytoestrogens. These are plant hormones that very closely resemble human estrogen, which when consumed will mimic and produce estrogen-like effects within the body. Will it make you grow a pair of ovaries? No, sir. But will it tamper with your natural testosterone production? Yes, it will, although in very small and negligible quantities. So it is figuratively a kick in the bollocks, albeit a very light and gentle one, but nevertheless, that's enough to make a man say no thank you. But forego a little hormonal balance and you've got yourself a top tier survival food. We're talking protein, fiber, easy ID, and widespread abundance. The red clover has it all. <sighs> you smell that? Yeah. Smells like the front page of National Geographic, that's what. What do you know about mucilaginous medicinal plants? Not much? Well, here's one for you. This here is known as ribwort plantain, or plantango lancelotta. A widespread and incredibly common resident of summer fields, this plant carries with it a wide range of medicinal applications, such as cough medicine, treatment for dysentery, and on-the-fly temporary band-aids for burns, bites, and stings. Bold claims us, eh? But all backed up by modern science. But slow down there just a minute, Jeff, because we got a talk ID. Ribwort plantain features an ovoid or bullet-shaped flower head, which will often have a small band of tiny white flowers in orbit around it. It also features a long, thin, wiry stem and prominently veined, slender, spear-shaped leaves. Not a plant that boasts any particularly remarkable features, and thus it is one that is easily lost amongst the long grass, but recognising that small band of orbiting flowers is a quick and easy means of positive identification. And now, onto the aforementioned medicinal properties. For cough medicine, you should eat a handful of leaves, seeds and flower heads, as those parts of the plant are very high in a substance known as mucilage, aka plant mucus, a very waxy and oily substance which, when ingested, will soothe and form an artificial protective lining over the irritated mucous membranes of a cough-ridden respiratory system. Like a thick gel coating, it will protect the inflamed areas of the body from further irritation. This mucilage can also coat and protect your digestive system, in particular your intestines, and that is incredibly useful in cases of dysentery in which inflamed and irritated intestinal linings are a typical painful symptom. And so, ribwort plantain is a great plant to consume if you've been drinking dodgy water out here. And for burns, bites and stings, then a poultice made from the crushed leaves of plantain can serve as your temporary band-aid. 
Just keep this cool and soothing pulp compressed beneath a bandage and it can speed up the healing process by promoting the coagulation of blood and by inhibiting the growth of bacteria. As the leaves of plantain do indeed contain a few mild antiseptic compounds. In conclusion, eat your hand for the leaves and seeds and that's coffin dysentery medicine. And a crushed wet pulp of fresh leaves, that's wound medicine. All in all, that's a 10 out of 10 would utilise. My fucking nature. Oh my god, could it be that we have just stumbled across the jewel of the forest? Yes indeed, you're goddamn right we have. So make yourself a cup of tea and get cosy, cause you about to learn today. This beautiful, most gorgeous, most aesthetic mushroom is known as the chanterelle. And this is a very special mushroom indeed. So, quick fast, let's talk ID. Shapes like a funnel, a trumpet, a bird bath. Bright yellow, uniform in colour, with wrinkles and veins all up the underside. And if you get real up and close and personal to this mushroom, then you will notice that it smells very lightly of apricots. Oh yes, yes, that is most frequent. The chanterelle is a highly prized and highly sought after edible mushroom. So much so that they are considered gourmet mushrooms all around the world. Yes, yes, we are talking the Gordon Ramsay, the Marco Pierre White, 500 quid for two bites tier fancy shit. Yes indeed, there is some real prestige behind these mushrooms. Why? Well it is because they are considered perhaps one of the best tasting mushrooms in the entire world. And that is no exaggeration my son, for you see, fresh out of the earth, these chanterelles will taste like peppery chicken. That's right, peppery chicken, you best believe it. A taste to die for and high in protein, giving you the energy required to swing axes and grow beards. Bring these back to camp and that is the mycological equivalent of having a deer slung over your shoulders. Oh yes, a welcome change from the tree bark and stagnant pond water, yes sir. And fun fact, the full scientific name of the chanterelle is Camphorellus siberius and siberius literally means edible food, nourishment, sustenance, and oh, that is most appropriate. These mushrooms are indeed edible raw. Good to go straight out the ground, but of course, it's always a best practice to cook them first. And out here in the wild, a quick and easy way to cook mushrooms on the fly is to drop them in a cup of boiling water and blitz them, but that will turn the mushrooms rubbery. And that, in the case of the chanterelle, is blasphemous. And so instead, what you can do, if you've got the time, is to swish and swirl them around in some cold, clean, purified water skewer them onto a stick and then gently roast them over the fire like marshmallows. And that right there, my son, is how you achieve enlightenment. Just look at them, observe them, for they are most beautiful indeed, most aesthetic, like a freshly buttered crumpet. Oh yes, Royal Britannia. But wait, what is this? Ah, oh, no, it cannot be. The aesthetics, they're too strong. Looking gorgeous, smelling gorgeous, and tasting gorgeous. The chanterelle is definitely one to keep an eye out for so that you may stay well nourished while out on the trail. Muscular atrophy, no sir, not today. And so pro tip, if you do want to save the world, get the girl and prepare that feast of delight for yourself while also caring for the ecology of fungi, then know this. When it comes to collecting mushrooms, rather than ripping them out of the ground, instead try cutting them through the base of the stem. That way their root system will stay in place and the mushroom will grow back next year. But there would be no prestige to mushroom gathering if there were not any toxic lookalikes to have to worry about. Well, the chanterelle does indeed have a few toxic lookalikes and the most notable of which is the jack-o'-lantern or Omphalotus alorius. These two mushrooms do share very similar anatomical features, but the most immediate and some may say obvious difference between them is the colour. Chanterelles are a uniform bright yellow, whereas the jack-o'-lanterns are a pumpkin shade of orange. And that's easy enough really, but the jack-o'-lanterns are much more than just mere lookalikes. Nay, they are incredibly special within their own right. For you see, come nightfall, then you may notice that these jack-o'-lanterns 
will glow in the dark. Of all the spectacles in nature, few can make you question your own sobriety in the way that the jack o lanterns can, and few can make you question your own position on the earth in the way that the jack o lanterns can. Like, where are we? Zangamarsh? Haha, no, sir. We are in Great Britain. This spectacular emission of light is due to the presence of luciferin, a bioluminescent chemical that will absorb sunlight during the day and then re emit it back out at night. Known by some as fox fire or fairy fire, this magical ability is one that only few fungi in the world possess. So rare and unheard of that it may mesmerize and enchant an unsuspecting camper into leaving behind the safety and security of of their camp and into the dreaded depths of the forest where the many lurking horrors await. So you gotta stay vigilant out here my son, you gotta stay strapped and stay loaded, you gotta keep two hands on the nine like it's quarter to ten you know what I'm saying, you gotta keep that head on a fucking swivel son. But fun fact though, glowworms and fireflies also use luciferin to produce their nightlight so although it is rare in the fungi world there is certainly no shortage of bioluminescent luciferin out here. But now, moving on, we're going to take our peppery chicken and skadoodle on forwards. It's time for you to meet a leaner, meaner, super saiyan version of the dandelion. Behold! A member of the sunflower family and a relative of the dandelion. It's the bigger older brother to join the biker gang. This is Jack Goes to Bed at Noon otherwise known as Meadow Salsify. That's quite a mouthful indeed, and a very curious name, that first one. What does it mean? Well, this flower is somewhat of a rarity. It is special in that it can only be seen in bloom for a couple hours of every day. That curious name comes from its irregular sleep cycle. For you see, flowers in general will open out their petals in morning sunshine and then close them back up in the evening. But old Jack goes to bed at noon, does as the name would suggest, and closes back up prematurely in the afternoon. It just slams those curtains shut and hits the hay at midday. Oh, it's a real special snowflake, but here's the kicker. The entirety of this plant is edible. Leaves, shoots, roots, stems and petals. The root in particular is worth digging for, as it's often a very large, substantial tap root that actually tastes quite sweet. So that's Jack, the slumbersome flower. Aha, a head like a shaving brush, most colourful, most vibrant, and sharing an uncanny resemblance to the thistle. But ah, this is not a thistle, no sir, this is knapweed, or Centauria nigra. Fun fact, back in the day, and we're talking the Middle Ages here, these knapweed flower heads were known as the buttons of the bachelorette. Why? Well, they were known as such because these flower heads were worn upon the dresses of females in order to advertise their fertility and eligibility for marriage. Yes, indeed, they were worn upon the person to advertise the fact that she was ready, ready to harvest your semen so that she may lay eggs, as to ensure the survival of the species. But courtship aside, the knapweed plant is also edible. The flower heads and the leaves are actually fairly half decent in taste. So ah. That's some cheeky fragrant nibbles right there. And while it may share an inflorescence that is nigh identical to the thistle, it does however lack the prickly spiked leaves. And so, gather into doddle, no trouble, easy life. But here's another fun fact. Knapweed has many colourful siblings within its genus, one of which is known as the cornflower. And this special blue variety of knapweed was known as the button of the bachelor, a flower that was to be worn by the men in order to advertise their availability. And another relative worth mentioning is the yellow star thistle. Now, I made a brief point about knapweed not being a thistle, but this one takes the biscuit. But here's another fun fact. All three of these colourful flowers belong to the genus of Centauria, which was named after the Greek mythological creature known as Chiron, a centaur whom supposedly used these knapweed flower heads in order to cover and heal the festering wounds that he suffered in battle. And so, right here, there's a hell of a lot of history in this tiny patch of earth. Aha, yes. Behold, the hero shot of the majestic crow or raven. I don't fucking know some, but look at it and how it gazes off onto the horizon. Oh, and it's gone. 
for another six months. Behold, a majestic malice crab apple tree, full to the brim with delicious edible apples. Crab apples get a bad rep around these parts, so are they sickly, are they toxic? But no sir, crab apples are completely safe to eat, providing that you don't consume the ones that have been lying on the ground for god knows how long. If you want to eat them, then you got to pluck them fresh off the tree, and if you want to go next level, you got to drop them in some boiling water, as this will not only clean them thoroughly, but it will also reduce some of the bitterness. But if you do not particularly fancy them as food, then perhaps I can sell you on their use as a mild antiseptic for you see crab apples are quite acidic they have a ph of three to four and so much of the neutral ph7 favoring bacteria out here will have a very difficult time setting up shop in the acidic environments that crab apples provide therefore if you slap a strip of crab apple over a cut or wound then its acidity will provide you with a weak antiseptic that will help to prohibit the growth of bacteria it's not super effective but it's better than nothing and did you know fun fact that in ancient Greece, throwing an apple towards the lady you desired was considered a genuine declaration of love, a symbolic gesture of affection, because the apple is the fruit of Aphrodite, the goddess of love. Prepare yourself, for I am about to introduce you to mycological royalty, the monarch of the mushroom world. Yes, yes, before you stands the regal fungi known as the king oyster mushrooms, otherwise known as the royal trumpets. Ah, oh, the gods have seen fit to bless us today, because this is a good one. So what's all the fuss about then? Why are we salivating? Well, the king oyster mushrooms are edible mushrooms that are revered in many places for their excellent taste and texture. Not quite the chanterelle I should add but they are definitely considered one of the most desirable mushrooms that you can find out here and as a bonus it's a real entry level easy mode edible fungi to identify why well because their features are so simple so let's take a look at them let us observe them as you can see they have an incredibly thick brilliant white stipe that's the easy mode. A tan coloured cap on top, host to brown gills on the underside. That's the easy mode. And they can be found together growing nice and neatly in these tightly packed close knit clusters. Oh, that's easy mode, real plain and simple features right there. And they're a pretty easy OTFI from a distance, since they resemble a bunch of milk bottles or bowling pins that have seen the business end of a blowtorch. The king oysters are a pretty popular mushroom around the world. In Japan and across southern Europe, they are widely grown and cultivated for food, a staple in many cultures. And so that's a bit of an assurance that you're in for a real treat if you're lucky enough to stumble across them out here. And the absolute best thing about king oyster mushrooms is that they have absolutely no toxic lookalikes. So these are practically handed to you on a plate out here. They are easy to identify with no chance of accidentally poisoning yourself. So that's a free meal if I ever done seen one. And so you can sink your teeth into those thick meaty stems and that's a real substantial bundle of calories right there. That is nourishment for days. But now see, here's the thing. Just because you can eat them, that does not necessarily mean that you should. Because while king oysters may be common in other parts of the world, here in Britain, they are incredibly rare. And so here lies a moral crisis, a trade-off. Either a tasty, substantial meal of cheeky edible mushrooms or brownie points with Mother Nature for exercising those low-key conservation plays. Hmm, that is a tough decision, but we're going to opt for the latter today because we ain't about that regicide. And here we have a member of the geranium genus of plants. This flower is called crane's bill, which sounds quite sinister, but no, no. It is called the crane's bill because the fruit pod or the seed pod of the flower is said to resemble the beak or the bill of a crane, which is a bit of a stretch, but why not, eh? An edible flower. You can graze upon the leaves and petals, but the root was once used for an on-the-fly medicine because of its bitter and astringent properties. The mashed roots were placed in the mouth to soothe and constrict the inflamed areas of tooth infections and ulcers. So much like chewing tobacco, you would just keep that mashed up root pressed against the problem area. 
between the tooth and the cheek. Also, those mashed bitter roots were once used as a bootleg treatment for hemorrhoids. Now, I can't recall if I've mentioned on-the-fly hemorrhoid treatment before, but there are a lot of plants that people used to shove up their ass out here. For example, conkers or horse chestnuts are another one that we used, which is not a very ergonomic suppository. No, sir, that's pain for days, but anyway, I think I spy me a relative over in that there shrubbery. Yes, indeed. We have found another member of the geranium genus, the brother of the crane's bill. This is Stinky Bob. Yes, indeed. Not a very elegant name, but a very appropriate name, as this is indeed one stinky flower, but not in the way that you might think. Oh, that's mystery. Five pink petals, each with their own subtle white streaks, fern-like leaves, and foliage that will turn a bright blood red towards the end of autumn. Oh, it's a real special snowflake, but not a very pleasantly scented one. And here's why. If you crush up the leaves of old Stinky Bob, then it will release the pungent scent of burning rubber burning tires. That's enough to make a mango. It is a very strange and unnatural scent for a plant to produce, but therein lies its use as an insect repellent, as insects will generally find the smell of petroleum repulsive. So mash up them leaves and apply those pungent smelling oils onto your clothes, and you'll be repelling all kinds of things. Aha, uh -huh, we've just stumbled across some teasel, or Dipsicus fulanum, a useful fire-making tool worth looking out for in the winter, but more on that in a moment. A most majestic plant, typically growing upwards to heights of 9 feet tall, shaped like a big old q-tip, it has a thin spiky stem that supports a much larger egg-shaped flower head. A flower head which has a thin band of pink lilac flowers wrapped around it. Oh, now that's all very nice. Like a garter around the supple fires of your concubine, but probably not as welcoming because this plant is absolutely littered in ferocious spikes to the point where even the goddamn leaves have spikes on them. But you might be into that kind of thing. Anyway, come autumn or come winter, the dead and dry rigid stalks of teasel make for an excellent hand drill for friction fires, providing you shave off all the thorns of course. But teasel also has a potential as an alternative on the fly medicine for the life-threatening outdoor illness known as Lyme disease. Not familiar? Well, let me tell you about Lyme disease. You know about ticks, right? Those fun little things. Well, Lyme disease is a bacterial infection transmitted to humans via the bite of the tick. The bacteria these ticks transmit are known as Borella, and these are drill bit or corkscrew shaped bacteria that, once inside your body, are able to wiggle around and drill themselves deep into your muscles, your organs and your joints. They can burrow themselves so deep within the tissue that they can hide away, so much so that your immune system is no longer able to detect them. And so these bacteria will then be free to fester, spread and replicate freely until they eventually shut down your organs and send your body into septic shock. And that is RIP. Sounds pretty bad, well it is pretty bad, and the only legitimate treatment for Lyme disease is a hardcore course of antibiotics. But if you are hypothetically off the grid with no access to antibiotics, then you are so fucked. But there is some hope, they say, for you see, it is speculated that if you were to chow down on some teasel root, then by some mechanism or other, the teasel root is said to be able to draw out the bacteria from within the joints and back into areas of the body in which your immune system can then detect and destroy them. However, that all sounds very well and good, but there is very little scientific evidence to support this. So it's falling within the realm of hippy-dippy bullshit. But since Lyme disease is pretty much a death sentence out here without proper medical treatment, then you have absolutely nothing to lose by going for that Hail Mary play and chowing down on some teasel root. And if it doesn't work, then at the very least, you'll die with a belly full of carbohydrates and your corpse will make good fertilizer for the soil. Oh my 
God! Decorating many of the plants out here are these globules of spit. Now, that is a very curious thing. Could it be human spit? Could it be animal spit? Well, many would seem to think so, as some common names for this phenomena include pigeon spit, cuckoo spit, frog spit, and even snake spit, but those are all misleading because these sudsy bubbles are actually produced by a tiny green insect known as the spittle bug. Oh yes, most appropriately named. Much like the shell is home to the snail, the spit is home to the spittle bug. These are tiny insects that produce and then encase themselves in a foam of frothed up plant sap, which closely resembles saliva. For the spittle bug nestled inside, this frothy foam bubble bath serves a number of purposes. Not only does it conceal them away from the view of outside predators, but it also protects the bug from extreme changes in temperature. Without this wet foam covering, those poor spittle bugs would quickly dry out and perish in today's heat. So think of this spit as a little soapy shelter, a cold and cool amniotic cocoon. Fun fact though, the spit of the spittle bug does not come from the mouth, no, it comes from the other end. It is essentially anal froth, which is a bit less magical, but hashtag nature. Peace. Here's a quick one for you. This crimson plum coloured shrub is known as dogwood or corner sanguina. These blackberries, are they edible? No sir, they are not. Not toxic per se, but they are definitely inedible. Their higher tannin content renders them incredibly bitter, and the body will reject many of its contents. It is the botanical equivalent of eating a crayon, because while it may not harm you biologically, it will certainly make you incredibly sick. But the real eyebrow raiser here is how similar these berries look to elderberries. And that's a mistake you don't want to make, so to avoid misidentification, then here's the lowdown. Elderberries are shiny and smooth, whereas dogwood berries are matte and slightly rough and abrasive due to the presence of fine hairs along the outside of the berry. Aha! This most impressive and colourful tranquilizer dart shaped flower is Solanum delcamara, otherwise known as bittersweet nightshade. Now, you may have heard the name nightshade before because it is quite an infamous family of poisonous plants. Well, this bittersweet nightshade is one of the lesser poisonous members of the family, but still enough to make a man nauseous, so let us observe it. Oh yeah, look at it. Oh, that's it, son. Pretty easy to identify, but the flowers are not the concern. What you really want to look out for are the deceptively attractive berries. These flowers will eventually wilt and fall, leaving only behind a bright, colourful berry. A toxic berry that will start off green, progress through yellow and orange until eventually settling at red. The name bittersweet does kind of imply that the berry may initially taste bitter, but then soon turn sweet, but nay, it is the opposite. First it will taste sweet, and then it will turn bitter. A bitterness that accumulates and soon becomes unbearably disgusting, so that alone will typically prevent anyone from eating a harmful quantity of them. So it's got your back out here kind of. Now, it is worth taking this time to mention perhaps the most notorious member of the Nightshade family. We are talking, of course, about the Belladonna Nightshade, otherwise known as Deadly Nightshade, which, as the name would suggest, is extremely poisonous. They say that just two Belladonna Nightshade berries are enough to make a man convulse, but do not be so alarmed as they are fairly easy to identify and avoid. They are large blackberries that sit upon what appears to be a cushion of several petals, or a five sepaled calyx if you want the technical term. Definitely a plant worth knowing about so that you don't accidentally die, you know, that's always good. But here's a fun fact though, the nickname Belladonna means beautiful woman in Italian, and that is a reference to the outdated practice of beautiful women dropping the juice of deadly nightshade berries into their eyes in order to dilate their pupils, which was and still is considered a very attractive and seductive feature to have.
stay low, stay cautious, safety off, as before us lies a dilapidated wooden shack, yes, remnants of a bygone era. Oh, keep that head on a fucking swivel, son, because I think we've gone off course. This horse seems to confirm the suspicions that we have indeed made some slight navigational errors. Look at it, the majestic stallion, the noble steed, wagging its tail. Oh, I think I'll leave you to it, son. Oh, right then. Cross this field and we back on track. Just need to avoid the buckshot, avoid the angry farmers, don't get caught, don't get fist fucked like the sign of lawnmower, and that's the strap. But let's just take a moment to admire these green fields and blue skies. Oh, that's most spacious, and I would say fresh air too, but oh, it ain't too fresh around these parts, my son. No, sir, that's some manure. If you're venturing in through the summer fields and chalky grasslands then you may come across these apricot scented flowery spikelets that are known as agrimony or agrimonia filiosia. Now if you know the deal then this is a refreshing sight to behold because if you gather up a handful of those yellow flowers and brew them up into hot or cold clean water then you've got yourself a delicious apricot scented beverage. Ah oh, yes, Rule Britannia. I would say it's best served cold, like an iced tea or a sweet tea. Or perhaps served alongside a fresh batch of chanterelles for those complimentary flavours, and for the compliments from the females that will be most impressed with your culinary prowess. But fine dining aside, there is an alternative use for agrimony. In many textbooks, you will typically find a brief note about agrimony having antiviral properties, potentially effective against viral infections such as influenza and hepatitis. But these notes are so brief. You're like, damn, go away, you're being so vague out here. And so, you take it upon yourself to make some more fucking inquiries, and you come across this. A study from 2009 titled The Broad Spectrum Antiviral Effect of Agrimonia Piliosia Extract on Influenza Viruses. Now, if you don't fancy reading through all that, the main takeaway point is this. When shit hits the fan, and you've got the global pandemics that are killing off 99% of the population, and you're out here, off the grid, with no other alternative medicines available, then kicking back and chowing down on some agrimony is probably not a bad idea. Look at this puffball, look at it, look at it, look at it! Observe it, for it is most beautiful. Most elegant. In Campus Fetics 11, we briefly spoke about lycopodinosis, a respiratory disease caused by the inhalation of puffball spores. Now, I hear you asking, how can that be so? Well, here is a picture of puffball spores under an electron microscope. As you can see, each spore is a sphere laced with spikes, like a mace or a morning star. Once these get inside your throat and lungs, they smash the shit out of absolutely everything. As they tumble on down through your respiratory system, your throat, your esophagus, your lungs, your bronchii, oh, that's enough to make a man go bleh. Breathe in those spores and it's like breathing in fiberglass and that's no bloody good son. So, let us continue. And here we have the antiseptic Herb Bennett. Not a relative of Herb Robert, mind you. Herb Bennett is an anglization of the Latin Herba Benedicta, meaning the blessed herb, as this plant was once used as an antiseptic to treat various infections. This plant is found commonly along the forest's edge, either in the form of this gold star or, after pollination, a spiky ball of Velcro burrs. Oh, look at it. That's Snag City right there. Herb Bennett's antiseptic properties lie solely within the root. Dig up the root and the first thing you'll notice is a surprisingly pleasant scent. A sweet, spicy scent that is identical to the scent of cloves. That scent comes from the chemical known as eugenol, an antiseptic compound used primarily to treat infections of the mouth. How? Well, the roots would be mashed up and pulped into water to be used as a mouthwash, and for any abscess or tooth infection then the root was chewed down into a mulch and then left in place against a troubled area of the mouth. Eugenol, however, does have some toxicity if it is swallowed, so you would have to spit out any of the excess salivate it generates. Again, you would use this a lot like chewing tobacco, and for topical skin treatment one could just wash the root and then pulverise it into a poultice, for the destruction of bacteria and the inhibition of any further bacteria growth. Ladies and gentlemen, take note of this big old plant that stands before you and its large disc of lacy white flowers, because now it is time 
to delve into the nightmare realm of botany. Today we are going to talk about the Umbelliferae family of plants, a vast and extensive family characterized by an umbrella shaped bloom of lacy white flower heads. A very worthwhile group to get to know. Why? Well, because it is host to some of the most wonderful wild edibles out here such as the wild carrot, but at the same time the family is also host to some of the UK's most deadly toxic poisonous plants such as giant hogweed and poison hemlock. And as you can see they all look incredibly similar, nigh identical on the surface, which is why this is the nightmare realm of botany, because the only way to tell apart the poisonous from the edible is through scrutinous observation of leaf shape and stem details, which all sounds very fiddly, but it's actually not too bad. And so I'm going to talk about a few of those bad boy umbelliferas today, and we're going to start off right here with this one. This is cow parsnip. Right off the bat, that is a fairly impressive plant five feet high with a humongous humble flower head. Oh, it's definitely a peacock. It's all about the showmanship. This is known as cow parsnip nowadays, but previously it was known as wild celery because this does indeed belong to the same genus as normal celery. This is just a less desirable, but nevertheless still a somewhat edible variety. It features typically green stems, or in some cases, bruised purple stems that are covered in thick bristly hairs and are host to deep vertical ridging, or ribbing, you know, like legit celery, it's ribbed for her pleasure. It also features very large compound leaves with, I'll say, a serrated edge, but the proper term is incised, you know, like incisors, sharp teeth. Now, if you think that sounds all very simple, easy OTFI. Then son, you've forgotten you're in the nightmare zone. Because while cow parsnip is edible, its sap, however, can cause a harsh rash if it comes into contact with your skin in sunlight. Only in sunlight. And so gloves are required for harvesting and cooking is required to neutralize the toxins. It is fiddly business and plus, worse still, the cow parsnip has a deadly toxic poisonous identical lookalike known as giant hogweed, which just so happens to be Britain's most toxic poisonous plant. We're talking the more fucking melt your skin off like pizza cheese kind of poisonous plant. And so it is not recommended that you eat wild celery because number one, it's fiddly to process. Number two, it's very risky. And one mistake means your brown bread son. And number three, wild celery has almost no calories. Your body actually burns more calories digesting it than it does from consuming it. And so since we ain't about those high risk, low reward plays out here, we're gonna move along on to the next one. The next umbelifera on the list is poison hemlock. Sounds wonderful. Now, this is a fascinating one because it is so toxic that it was actually used to execute prisoners back in the days of ancient Greece, but more about that in a moment. Poison hemlock shares the lacy white flower heads of the cow parsnip, but as you can see, the head is far less impressive a lot smaller and a lot more scruffy. Other differences include slim fern-like leaves and a smooth hairless stalk and stem. But the key feature to look out for when it comes to poison hemlock is the purple spots and blotches that decorate the stem. That's how you know right off the bat that you're dealing with poison hemlock, those purple blotches. They are a feature that is shared across most of the toxic umbelliferae. So beware the purple blotches, I say. Plus, one more identifiable feature, the stench of poison hemlock. It is rancid, I say. It smells like a dead mouse in a dusty attic. And that is enough to make a man go bleh. But just because it is poisonous and smelly, that doesn't mean it doesn't have its uses. No, no, for you see, not only did the ancient Greeks force feed their prisoners poison hemlock juice in order to execute them, the most famous victim of which was the Greek philosopher Socrates, who was sentenced to death via hemlock juice, or the ancient equivalent of the lethal injection, but also there is evidence to suggest that the Native Americans used hemlock juice to poison their arrowheads. Oh, now that is interesting. Because if the arrow doesn't kill you, then the poison will. Fun fact, coralline is the principal toxin of poison hemlock, and the way it works is by blocking your nervous system from transmitting signals to your muscles. So, in other words, it causes paralysis. A paralysis that is gradual. First, you turn paraplegic then you turn quadriplegic, and then for the coup de gras, once you are completely immobilized, it will paralyze your diaphragm, which renders you unable to breathe, and so you will slowly choke and suffocate to death. And that is poison hemlock 
in a nutshell. But let's take a step back from the ooh scary plants that will kill you and talk about some of the tasty wild edibles that you can find within the Umbelliferae family. Because we got one right here and this is a real prize. This is the MVP wild edible that makes learning about umbelliferas totally worthwhile. This is the wild carrot, Dorcas carota, beneath the soil, anchoring this plant to the ground, is a big old root vegetable that is indeed a legitimate edible and delicious variety of carrot. Kablam! Not an orange carrot, mind you. It's not quite the store-bought variety you get down Tesco, but it's close enough. And aside from the colour difference, they are as equally as nutritious. High in sugar, with good carbs, good starch, and good calories. It is a damn fine wild edible to know about. With a taste to die for, you know. And some may even say, that it's enough to make a man engorge with blood and fuck a hole in the ground. But not for real though, let's talk ID. Passing by, the wild carrot looks just like any other umbelliferae. A lacy white flowery head with pure green furry stems and fern-like shaped leaves. It has elements of both cow parsnip and the poison hemlock, which can be confusing, but for a super duper easy peasy positive ID of wild carrot, all you need to do is take a closer look at that flower head, because right there, directly in the centre, you will spot a single solitary crimson coloured flower, like a single droplet of blood upon a t-shirt, that colourful crimson flower is a feature unique only to the wild carrot. And so, there should be absolutely no worries about mistaking it for a poisonous lookalike out here, because nothing else within the family has that central coloured crimson flower. But if that feature alone does not instill you with great confidence, and it shouldn't really, you should always be thorough, then you can bust the second step of verification. While wearing gloves, you gotta dig up the root and give it a smell. And if it's the wild carrot, then it will smell exactly like carrots. And that is absolute unmistakable verification. Oh mother nature, she's done us a solid by absolutely spoon feeding this wild edible to us out here. The smell of carrot is strong and it's enough to make a man salivate so just give these roots a quick rinse and a wash in clean water and chow down on this hearty little trail nibble. If you're lucky you'll find them growing in loose dry soil and so with a good grip down at the base of the stalk you can pull up the whole lot in just one swift motion. So very little energy investment for a substantial amount of carbs and calories. And that is the low risk, high reward plays that we're looking for out here. And so you can now sit back, relax and chow down on one of Mother Nature's most highly prized and highly esteemed wild edibles. That concludes our session on the Umbelliferae. There are many, many more to look out for, but my God, that's enough for now. Right then son, I'm about to break you in to a large genus of plants known as the vetches. So, this one right here is an easy mode vetch to start off with. This is known as the common vetch, or Vicia sativa. Now, I imagine that quite a few ears pricked up upon hearing the name sativa, but no sir, you must calm down, as you cannot smoke this plant. Well, I mean, you can, but it ain't gonna do much for you. No, no, the vetches serve a different purpose. The USP, the unique selling point of this plant, is that it is a member of the pea family. Once these flowers die back, then it will reveal a pea pod full of edible peas, which has come to be known as the poor man's pea. Edible for humans in small quantities, but this was primarily grown and cultivated as feed for livestock. There is even evidence to show that the Romans grew and used poor man's pea to feed their cavalry. Now, vetch is an odd name, but it stems from the original Latin vicia, meaning to bind to, to tie up to twist around, and that is reference to this plant's many creeping vines and tendrils that will twist themselves around any neighbouring plants in order to keep the main stem of the vetch upright. So the old common vetch is a very recognisable face. You have these plump purple flowers and leaves that look like ladder rungs. Long leaves that look a lot like labia. Right? The vetches are a vast genus and come in a wide variety of colours, most widespread of which is yellow. And here in amongst this bush we have a yellow variety known as the horseshoe vetch. It has the same flower shape as the common vetch, but a different framework. This one grows quite low to the ground in large tufts, and its flowers bend off from the stem at a 45 degree angle, said to resemble the wheel of a ship when looked at from underneath, so easy ID more or less. And here we have another one. This one is known as 
meadow vetch or meadow vetchling aka meadow pea different from the horseshoe vetch in that its flowers bloom in a tight variable height cluster up at the very end of a very long stem look at it and its lack of symmetry but nevertheless still most beautiful and still most bountiful as this too produces a pea And then there are yellow vetch bushes that, upon closer inspection, have distinctive red pigment and streaks all along them. These are a special one, in that they deviate away from the usual vetch name, and instead are called bird's foot trefoil, named after the appearance of its seed head, which does indeed resemble a talon. But its yellow and red hues have also earned it the common nickname of bacon and eggs. But despite that appetising name, it is unlike other vetches in that it will release toxic hydrogen cyanide when the plant is crushed or damaged. In small doses this isn't particularly harmful, but anything with cyanide in the name should generally be avoided. But here we have the big daddy of the pea-producing wild plants, perhaps the most impressive and most glorious of them all. This is known as goat's rue, or French lilac. Now, you can tell it is of the fetch family by the pussy lip shaped leaves, but this was not used as animal feed, no sir. This plant was actually used for poison fishing. The crushed leaves and roots contain the toxin rotenone, which, when thrown into the water, will interfere with the fish's ability to breathe, which causes them to rise up to the surface to gulp for air, where they are then more vulnerable to being caught by hand or spear. Goat's rue is toxic to both humans and livestock, which is the reason behind the name for you see the word rue is somewhat of an old word meaning regret or sorrow so it is with regret that the goats chose to graze upon this plant for it is indeed most poisonous but nevertheless it is a very impressive plant very showy and incredibly decorative oh one could say that it is most aesthetic We're taking five, we're observing this magpie ink cap, while we consume some calories. What we got Shornicus, Shornicus has some beta male dried fruit, and all Alpha Sphinx, what's he got something good obviously, we got pistachio nuts. Oh that's that sodium, them electrolytes, they are required. It is time for a rapid fire segment, because I've seen five plants in close proximity, so let's put a name to the face. First up we have the broadleaf willow herb, Epilobium montanium. Found typically in the shady patches off the side of the trail, they are distinctive due to those notched petals. This broadleaf willow herb is a relative of the rose bay willow herb, aka fireweed. You'll know that, right? So this is its little brother. And this plant is indeed edible, although it is slightly bitter. And next we have Common Centauri. This is quite an aesthetic arrangement of plump pink petals, stemming from a single solitary stalk. Centauri goes by many other names, but one of which is bitterwort, which gives you an indication as to what it may taste like. Not recommended. And there's a bit of an old Celtic myth that stumbling across these Centauri flowers would bring about you good luck, so here's to hoping. Oh, look at that bit of sweet nightshade. Yeah, that's it. And now have a look at these. Don't you think they look a bit like cranberries? Well, that is no coincidence, as these fruits do indeed belong to the cranberry family. These are known as Guelda rose fruit. They look delicious, right? But no, they're not. They are edible in very small quantities, but they are very acidic, almost unpalatably sour. However, they do have the really interesting aftertaste of cough medicine, which is certainly strange, so it's worth a cheeky nibble just for curiosity's sake. And here's another umbelliferae to add to the collection. This is arguably the most common member of the family. This is cow parsley. Significantly smaller than other members, cow parsley can be considered the love child between cow parsnip and poison hemlock. Why? Well, because it features the furry green stem of cow parsnip, but the fern-like leaves of hemlock. It is somewhat of a hybrid, but another distinct and identifying feature of the cow parsley is in amongst that frilly umbral flower head are a bunch of upright vertical seed pods which somewhat resemble candlesticks or candle holders. Now, cow parsley is considered edible, but 
not recommended due to it tasting like shit. And lastly, these trumpet-shaped flowers are known as hedge bindweed. Now, if you watched the last episode of Campus Fix, then you may see the resemblance to the hallucinogenic morning glory. Similar, yes indeed, but they are unrelated. Eating the seeds of hedge bindweed won't earn you that free trip to the astral plane, no sir, but they do have a use. For you see, the stems of these plants are long, creeping, twisted vines, which are fairly strong, so if you double them up, then they can be used as improvised cordage for shelter building. That's the end of the rapid fire segment, let us proceed. Well, 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 would you look at that? It's a hawker dragonfly. Oh, look at it, looking most purdy, most docile, most dormant, and thus presenting us with a perfect opportunity to bust some fun facts. So, here's a fun fact about dragonflies. Of all the spectacles in nature, few can match the tantric mating rituals of the noble dragonfly. For you see, in the dragonfly world, when a man and a woman come together, they do so in the shape of a heart. Oh yeah, look at that, that is most romantic, most tantric. Namaste, motherfucker. And the reason they do this is because, to initiate the sexual encounter, the male dragonfly will use the quote-unquote claw at the end of his quote-unquote tail to grab a hold of the female by the neck. Yes, indeed. And then the female will arch her body forwards as to presenteth the vagina onto the phallus. And the end result is a heart and chakras in perfect alignment. But here's another fun fact. There are two types of D-fly. There are dragonflies and there are damselflies, right? So now you may be wondering, are damselflies the female version of dragonflies? And the answer is no. A damsel can be both male and female, as can a dragon. They do both belong to the same biological order, but they are separated by suborder. So the way to tell apart a dragon and a damsel is by its wings. When a dragon is at rest, its wings will lie open, perpendicular to the body. And when a damsel is at rest, its wings lie closed and in line with the body. Mistaking a dragon for a damsel or vice versa is a real schoolboy error. But now you know the difference. Mm -mm -mm. What you know about the smell of manure and pro tip? The magic mushrooms, the old infamous psilocybins, the old illegal class A controlled substances disclaimer, can often be found growing in amongst cow pat or cow dung. So a little place like this, a green pasture, would be the typical hunting ground for those with an interest. This bad boy right here is known as Traveller's Joy, Clematis vitalva. Typically found in amongst the hedgerow, it is a creeping vine that entangles itself around the surrounding shrubbery, relying on the sturdiness of other plants to keep itself above the ground and in the sunlight. Once it comes to seed, it produces these spiky balls of feathery fluff which can be used as an easy peasy flash tinder. Yeah, that's right. Now, this is not the best example because it has been quite humid out here today. So that moisture has caused the feathers to bind together. Usually they are a lot more fluffy and more noticeably flammable. Now, the best thing about this particular flash tinder is its longativity. This is one of the last available flash tinders that you can find out here. As during the months of late autumn and through to winter, the thistles and dandelions have long since dispersed, but the traveler's joy remains present, here to assist us in starting our forest fires during the winter months. <laughs> I just had some seed blown into my mouth and I didn't even get paid for it, what a joke. Oh my God! No, could it be? No, it cannot be. The prophecy, it did not forespeak of this. No, oh, cheeky bit of bird cherry right there. Now, what do you know about these? Black briony berries. Bambalam, a wild fruit that is most conspicuous in autumn when its creeping vines are festooned with bundles of colourful berries. Berries that appear to be most juicy, most succulent. But are they edible? No sir, unfortunately not. Inside every berry are thousands of tiny calcium oxalate crystals. These are microscopic needle-shaped rods that perforate your internal organs as they make their way down through your digestive system and into your urinary tract, which will then eventually exit out of your urethra, which will leave you literally pissing needles. And that's no fun. They are remarkably unpleasant things to eat, so no thank you, Jeff. We'll promptly move along. 
Have you ever wondered where fireweed gets its name from? You may assume it's something to do with its fire-making abilities, but nay, it is the fact that fireweed tends to flourish in areas previously ravaged by forest fires. They are most fond of ashy soil, so it is quite literally a weed that arises from the fire. Released its ashes. Like a phoenix! Well. Oi, 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 what's all this then? We've just stumbled across the edible chestnut mushroom. Genus and species, get ready for this one. Ajaricus bisporus var avalenius. Bit of a mouthful, so let's talk ID. Chestnut mushrooms are the chestnut coloured variant of the white button mushroom, also named Ajaricus bisporus. They are, for all intents and purposes, the exact same mushroom. The only difference between them is the colour. A colour variation that is superficial, however, as that brown pigment comes from an incredibly thin membrane that coats the cap. A membrane that is ever so thin and tenuous that, as the mushroom matures and the cap unfolds, it causes the membrane to rip, which exposes the white flesh underneath and sometimes gives way to the appearance of scales. It also features a brilliant white stipe and flesh that will stain pale brown upon bruising. And underneath the mushroom in young and adolescent specimens there will be a white partial veil concealing the gills of the mushroom. Bust that wide open though and you will find those gills. Gills that will either be pink or dark brown, depending on the maturity of the mushroom. A lot to remember, but fun fact. Another line of inquiry for mushroom ID is scent. These chestnut mushrooms, for example, smell very earthy and slightly sweet, very similar to the scent of almonds. Whereas other members within the Ajaricus genus can either smell like anise, which is a bit like licorice in a sense, or they can smell like phenol, which has a bit of a medical smell to it. You know, it smells a bit like a band-aid or a hospital waiting room. It's really hard to describe the scent of phenol, but anyway, we can say with certainty that these almond scented fungi are indeed the edible chestnut mushrooms. And so we're gonna quickly nab a few, cutting them through the stems, of course, and that there, my son, is a good note to end on. And so on that bombshell, it is time to end. Oh, it has been a long day, my son, but it has also been a productive day. We've covered a lot of ground, we've tamed some wild, we've captured some wildlife, and we've found some fungi. And that right there, that's good times. But that's not all, because we have also learned a couple new types of weapon poison and several new methods of infection prevention. But perhaps, most importantly, we have learned how to keep ourselves well fed while out on the trail, with the chanterelle and the wild carrot being the absolute MVP. Yes, a good day all in all, because my nature she provided. And now, as the sun sets upon us, it's time for us to kick back, relax, and reflect upon a day of exploration. Hmm, there was one particular thing that I was really hoping to find out here today, that being the giant hogweed plant, because it is so dangerous, so toxic, and so vicious in the way that it can melt your skin off with third degree burns that it really does deserve some special attention. But alas, today it was not to be. But hey, maybe tomorrow we'll take a different route home and we will find some of that giant hogweed. But until then, we chillin'. And with that, it's time for me to bid you a farewell and good night. So I thank you for watching, and I'll see you round, bros. Peace!